Moda, the town wary of countless southwesters, was home to two types of well-bred gentlemen of noble families, Elvis collectors and the Beatles collectors. Their habit was a kind of refuge or a harbor sheltering depressive, storm-weathered souls at the juncture of two continents, the guardian knot of age-long conflicts. A resident of Moda could not survive for long, something awful would become of him eventually, because the psychoses of the modern age, deep melancholy and artistic susceptibilities would never leave these despondent poor men alone. The healthy, content, white-haired elderly that you run into on the streets of Moda are never the natives of this town. They are either retirees from the military or bureaucrats who have completed their terms of service or parvenus from the country, for a true native of Moda never ages. He lives and fades away in a very short time frame, his heart full of ephemeral passions, a song fleeting in his ears and gloomy women left behind. And that sad song by Elvis in the background, always on my mind. He was not only a defeated man of a noble family from Moda, but also an avid Elvis collector, and maybe the most unfortunate man of Kadikoy, since in such an age of villainy and apathy, he had to raise an angel. Sometimes, in anguish, he would watch her leave their house and mix in with the sleazy crowds of Kadikoy. It would kill him each time to send his little angel into those brutes. Every one of them a figure from a Tarantino movie. These awful men had mistaken crudeness and rascality for modernity and avant-gardism. In that moment, he would turn his face to the God he never believed in and begin to pray. Dear God, please do not let them touch her. You should not allow this injustice. Let me pay the price. Most of the time, such cries were of no consolation. But he only found his solace in the embrace of old ballads from the past. First would come that same old song, always on my mind. Afterwards, he would dwell into the snowy pages of a Russian river novel based around aristocrats. Nevertheless, even when he was lost in one of Anna Karenina's St. Petersburg sequences, he would tear away from the snowfield, misty steps and taigas and remember the tears on his cheeks the day his little angel had put on her first makeup. He would see himself standing by the door and watching her turn into a made-up Natalia Ilyanisha Rostov, ready to enter the high society for the first time. Is the love of a man up for his daughter always filled with tear and heartache? Who can possibly know that? Can every father of a girl discern that feeling? Absolutely not. But a loving, caring Elvis collector from Moda? Why not? As long as the heroine of the story is as beautiful as the little angel and the song playing in the background is always on my mind. This little angel, on whom God prided himself, would paint a very absurd picture before my eyes every time she walked into bar decadence. In the midst of show-offs, rock and roll posers, yuppies, clownish feminists, hooligans, old ledgers, artistic charlatans, low brows passing as writers, monkeys posing as painters, fake businessmen and jackals imitating music critics. I would be struck silly each time I saw this refined manifestation of innocence and beauty. I would watch her with admiration, my insides melting with her every step. I scrutinized with apprehension her enthusiasm for poetry, her intellectual ambitions, and searched for a young man who would understand her, since these were all impossible tasks. Because she was not born to write, but to be written about, and this age did not produce young men who could fully grasp her sentimentalities and passions. While she was desperately strolling around like a Shakespearean figure, mediocrity tried to pull at her feet. She was a Sappho among the lepers. Her only concern should have been to keep everyone at bay, but sadly, no angel ever knew that. And thus, she never managed to avert any evil or wretchedness, and was always the heroine of stories that stung my heart with pain. Many times I wanted to jump in front of her and intervene, to give a piece of my mind to those degenerates for their attitude towards her, but I never could. I feared I would make a fool of myself due to the age gap. The last thing I wanted was to look like an old sleaze bag. Yes, I did love her, but this was more like devotion and respect towards a female saint, or like poetic inspiration derived from beauty. Or how should I say it? Put simply, more like a sublime feeling reminiscent of old black and white Turkish films where the wedding gowns descended from heaven.
silly and naive, but also as eminent, pure and innocent as in that Turkish movie, The Last Hiccup. It would be a mistake to imagine her as the actress, Hülya Kocid, coming down from the heavens in a bridal dress. Instead, she resembled a saint with a limpid beauty one could see on frescoes. This saint cursed the age she lived in, so her face was always covered in gloom. To see her that way made me feel the same. There were times when we could exchange a few words whenever she managed to lose those vile youths and free herself away from their exertive siege. No matter how happy I would feel in her presence, I could never stop myself from grumbling incessantly. Later, when I contemplated my ramblings, I would notice how reproachful they must have sounded. The guilt would not allow me to sleep at all that night. Towards dawn, when the seagulls started screaming for the scraps on the street with the whistles of the local boats in the background, I would text her this message and fall asleep. Always on my mind. This song was special. Once she had told me the story behind it. The song belonged to the aged noble Elvis collector from Moda, who was infatuated with it. And for some reason or another, she would always mention this song to me in our brief conversations at Bard Cadence. I would push away the idea that she was trying to project her father's image to me and begin recounting my favorite Elvis tales to her, tales I had heard at other taverns in summers past. All ears, she would drift off like a child lost in the bliss of a fairy tale. In the days that followed, always on my mind had become something like a cue between us. We would always play it to each other whenever possible. We would ask the DJ at Decadence to play it for us. We went so far as to ask radio DJs to do it. Always on my mind reverberated through the seemingly austere rock bars on Cadife Street. It was played solely for a fool from the age of romantics. A song that made its way from the house of a noble Elvis collector from Moda. A man weary from raising an angel. Later, an album from the same house made its way to my hands as well. The little angel had gone through his father's LP collection and had recorded his favorite tracks onto a CD. It still pains me to this day to remember how I had broken her heart over a trivial matter the day she handed me that gift. I guess it might have been one of my fits over how she allowed a miserable young man to talk to her. Or maybe something else for that matter. What I'm certain about right now is that I feel contemptible whenever I consider the impertinence I showed her when she brought me that gift from the collection of the person she prized the most. Yet the little angel did not mind. I had begun to act like those young brutes I always castigated, but she never took offense. She insisted on giving me the gift, and this middle-aged snot of a writer was finally so kind as to accept it. Dear God, how you allow your creatures to degrade themselves at times. Meanwhile, a saint of your creation, completely unaware of any offense, pride and other carnal deeds, like a true angel, insists on freely giving her gift and love, just like a character from the age of romantics. I listened to the album days on end. I never let on to her about this, but I found solace for my dejection with that album. We chatted with the little angel now and then, but I knew she had gone away. Nonetheless, we managed to turn our cue into a kind of pledge. For me, she was a saint and thus had to protect me. Having to act like a true knight all the time, I would text her and always on my mind whenever I found myself in distress. She would see it and protect me. Yes, this is how childish, sweet and tale like this was. We pursued this little game for years. During many struggles, I found great solace in the arms of the supreme feeling of trust. It was a wonderful feeling, an angel, a saint was omnipresently watching over me. Then other things got in the way. Spectacles I did not bear to witness. The little angel was searching for someone akin to her nature, and I never liked to see it, for I knew there was no match for her. On this matter, I assented to the thoughts of that Elvis collector from Moda. However, the little angel was persistent. She persisted on her search, ending up in griefs unjust. I stayed away from Kadikoy and Moda as much as possible while she lived through these times. I hung out with lackadaisical writers, overbold desperados, old slackers and washed up movie stars. They all made me feel good. What mattered was that they kept my mind off the little angel and her desperate attempts to find a kindred man. That's why I had quit texting her and asking for her protection during my battles, because I did not believe in her anymore. My faith and all her trust blown away, I began to lose my every fight. I sank deeper each day, 
I sank deeper even when it was natural to think that nothing could go worse. On one of my usual bleary days, I stopped by Carife Street where I chanced on a poster on the door of one of the bars at which we used to hang out. It said that the little angel was spinning that night. Fixed on the door, I did not notice my friend, the last Mohican, the barman, appear right beside me. That impossible man has passed away, he said. Which impossible man? I demanded. The little angel's father. I let out an oath. I was not surprised, but uttered it anyway. How long could a noble gentleman of Moda endure to raise a little angel in this squalid age? She is spinning for him tonight, he added. I walked into the bar immediately to spend the whole day. At night, when she entered the DJ cabin, the little angel seemed pale and worn out. All around her were young people who resembled rock musicians gathered to pay tribute to a rock figure. She saw me at the bar, wasted and beat from a day of drinking. We did not speak. She began with always on my mind. I knew this was not for me. It was dedicated to an honorable man from Moda. I sadly turned my eyes to the floor. A tear seeped from one. That instant, the last Mohican dropped a bottle of Bacardi to the floor. I could not make out if it was an accident or not, but as it crashed, I dropped the glass in my hand too. I crushed the pieces under my foot. Mist was descending over Moda. The little angel was sobbing inside the DJ cabin. Elvis was singing always on my mind. I, on the other hand, felt ashamed and hid my tears. From that day onwards, noble men of Moda separated into two different groups. Those who chose to go, with their albums and novels six feet underground, and those vile men who pretended not to understand and went on living.